生住屋。Decollage, lift off from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. We do have confirmation of observatory separation. The James Webb Space Telescope amidst applause here in the Mission Control Center. And there is the view、uh, from the upper stage camera on the Ariane 5, looking at the James Webb Space Telescope as it moves、uh, gently away from go, its launch vehicle. Go away, go away. Yes, go away. Ironically enough, as we marvel on、uh, this view from the upper stage camera, this will be humanity's last view. Of the James Webb te Space Telescope as it moves to its work place about a million miles away from Earth. Quite a Christmas present for the world's astronomers as the James Webb Space Telescope begins its life, heading towards deep space. After yesterday's successful completion, after yesterday's successful completion of Webb Sunshield deployment, mission controllers at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, are today ready to move on to the next major spacecraft milestone: the deployment of Webb's secondary mirror. In just a few minutes, the team will send a signal to release Webb's secondary mirror support system. Today's activities mark the first in a series of deployments related to Webb's optics. Those beautiful golden mirrors are fully tensioned. Exciting. Significant milestone accomplished. Job well done, Sunshield team. Job well done. Thank you, Mom. That is on the window. Please check on the takeoff vessel. And OC, that looks good. You're go to execute. I'm your host Michelle Thaler, and for the rest of this remarkable live stream, we'll be dialed into the action as mission managers proceed with setting up the Webb Observatory on its way to a parking orbit a million miles away from Earth. Joining me to share information and insights into this process is Julie Van Campen, the Deputy Commissioning Manager for James Webb. So, welcome, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Michelle. So,、um, as we listen for confirmation of the secondary mirror support structure release, let me talk a little bit about how things are going to work today.、Um, we're looking live at the MOC, the Mission Operations Center at the Space Telescope Science Institute at the, at, in the campus of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, up, Maryland. Step zero two zero. And you'll notice that we are occasionally pausing to listen,、okay. and that's because we are actually pausing to listen for the live updates from the MOC about the secondary mirror deployment. So as we are conversing, if you if you see us pause, we're both kind of you know wondering what's happening next. We're listening for the command because we are you are actually live with us today for this incredible secondary mirror deployment. So、um, so Julie, as we listen for confirmation of the secondary mirror support structure release,、um, how are things looking today? How are things going? Things are going really well today. Things have.、Um... Worked incredibly well over the past 12 days. You know, we've had moments of of、uh, excitement and、uh, lots of、uh, tension as we as we kind of wait to see how things、uh, work out. But overall, great. We're right on or slightly ahead of schedule. It's it's、uh, it's from the moment where Ariane Spas was able to put us right where we needed to in orbit. It's been going great. So,、um, what is the first step in today's deployment? And 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 you know, this involves something called NEAs. These are non-explosive actuators.、Uh, what is the team going to start that? They should start that soon.、Uh, right now, they're in the middle of checking out to make sure that the two motors that they use、uh, when they do the deployments are are working. They do an aliveness check. They make sure everything's、um, ready to go for it before they、um, release the launch locks. And then once they release the launch locks. They'll do a small move of the secondary support structure to 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 bring it out a little bit more than a degree.
um, check out all their telemetry, make sure that they're happy with how it's performing before they complete the full move. Complete the full move, then there's a, a sequence that they'll go through to lock, to lock the mechanism into position or it's so, at, yes. at the right um, uh, uh, orientation to have the the mute captured into the the, the observatory's um, wavefront sensing system and so that it can be aligned later on. Absolutely. So um, as our viewers are tuning in right now, let's uh, let's sort of go over what's uh, happening to uh, you know, on the screen in front of them. So as we mentioned, we see some windows into the MOC, the Mission Operations Center. And uh, that's, uh, as we said before, in the, on the Johns Hopkins campus, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And then on the left mm -hmm. side of your screen, you're, you're seeing an animation, but this isn't just any, you know, any random animation. This is actually based on real data. So, Julie, could you, could you tell us a bit about what we're looking at as, as far as this, this animation here? Sure. This is called our uh, observatory verify uh, visualization tool. And it's uh, a really um, interesting uh, work between 3D modeling and some telemetry coming directly from the spacecraft. And you'll be able to see this as we go through that there's some real-time telemetry being fed into a model, which then reacts as though this, the observatory is actually um, doing those movements in space. It's not a video or a model that's uh, pre-programmed to do that. It's actually receiving the telemetry we'll and can the model to match that uh, telemetry. We are go to stop the DU motor. So they're stopping the motor, they're doing their liveness check. NOC, you have a go. Stop the go to continue. So Julie, so, you, you were saying to me, oh, go ahead, please. I was going to say, you hear them talking to each other in the control room. Uh, each person has different call, call signals. So you'll hear one person called OC, that's the operation controller, and you'll hear CC, that's the command controller. And, and the two of them work together to make sure that all the commands that are sent up to the observatory are uh, exactly what we want to do and configured properly. And I verify that command queue is in the central window. So OC at this time, we are going to proceed on to step 022 to disable the ADU critical command. Coffee copy is back on the window. And OC, that looks good. You're going to execute. Copy that. Executing. And OC, you have a go to continue. Copy go to continue. So Julie, can you talk a bit about uh, the important thing that's happening today is the deployment of the secondary mirror, and uh, yes. give us a little sense about about you know what what this is. Oh, and as we as, and feel free to listen to the calls. I know that you're doing this live with Step us as well. Copies. And OC, I have also confirmed with the sure. lead that we are ready to perform the SMSS latch motor aliveness. So at this time, we are going to proceed on to step zero two four. So they just talked about the launch motor like, before they were uh, checking the, the deployment motor, and now they're going to check the latch motor because they have two different motors that have to operate during the sequence. And, OC, um, and the secondary mirror, it's left, uh, let's talk about execute. that for a moment. If you take a look at the, at the uh, visualization tool right now, you'll see that the, the mirror does um, does not and look very OC, functional at the moment. It's to broken into pieces. The two wings are folded back on the sides, and the secondary mirror is those two black lines going up to the top of the mirror. And it's a little hard to see, but the, the mirror itself is actually perched on top of the telescope on those two long uh, spindly legs. What will happen is it will fold out and it will put it down into the center of the, of the primary mirror where it can be a reflecting light back into the center of the telescope. Um, the Excellent. telescope itself is a reflective telescope. It's a, a three mirror anti-sigmat. Um, so it, the, the light, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later about the light path. And you'll see once it comes and out OC, that it's, stand it's by for right on the center of the telescope on, on three long spindly okay, legs. Standing by. 
Julie, I understand we have an animation that we can uh, play now about the uh, the secondary mirror and sort of how it will fold out. So uh, here we go. You can maybe you can just tell us what's going on here. Yep. So you can see the legs come out, and the top leg has a, a hinge in the middle of it, and it snaps into place. And the the we're seeing the back of the mirror, so it looks black. But that um, that that round item in the center is the mirror, and you can see it's held a certain dif distance away from the primary mirror. The primary mirror is um, concave, and the secondary mirror is convex, and it shoots the beam of light and back down through the center of the telescope. Off, those parameters look good. We the, are uh, go to continue with the motor. Instruments motor. are packed into a box. You can okay. kind of see behind the telescope. There's a there's a, a rectangular box with a with a sloped top to it. That's where all the instruments are packed back there, and they take the light in from the center of the telescope and and uh, bring it down onto detectors for us. And OC, we do expect uh, the yellow alarm for the uh, motor arm. So they're talking about um, alarms right now on the loops. And what they mean by that is as we um, move through different uh, checkouts, uh, there's telemetry that comes into the mock and it gets processed into a ground system. And that ground system looks at the telemetry and it has uh, different parameters set up. and uh, to alert us when things are happening, we've we've assigned uh, you know essentially colored lights to come on. It's on your digital screen. They're not light bulbs. Um, the so an alarm will come on someone's screen and say that this motor is doing something or this temperature sensor is doing something. Um, and some of them are meant to be in that state during different times, and some of them are, are not. So we watch them and we alert each other to our plan as to what we should be seeing at what time. For those of you who are uh, just joining us, we are looking at uh, live coverage of the deployment of the secondary mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope. You're looking at uh, uh, an animation that includes real-time telemetry, real-time data from the spacecraft as to the configuration that it's in and what's going on. Complete. Stand by for evaluation. Okay, and you're listening to uh, live uh, commands coming from the Mission Operations Center, or MOC, at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. OC that pops on ops. We have verified that the sync move was good and we are go to proceed with the launch lock releases for the SMSS. At the time, we are go to proceed onto step 026 for all panels safe verify. Okay, copy. And we have an expert so with us. Uh, the window? Yes, please, please go ahead. See that command on it's good. You are good to execute. Copy. Execute. This point, I'm getting ready to release the launch locks. And OC, uh -huh. you're good to continue. Copy, go to continue. We're going to hold here and listen to the commands. This is a, a, a very momentous uh, <laughs> event happening, the extension, getting ready to extend the secondary mirror. You're watching live coverage of this. We'll hold here just for a little while, and we're going to listen to commands from the mock. As we listen to for more commands from the mock, uh, one thing I'll add is that we will have time, we believe, to take some questions from social media. Use the hashtag AskNASA. We will get to as many of those as we can. We're on multiple platforms, wherever you are. Hashtag AskNASA. Step out copies, and I can confirm all channels are safe. So at this time, we are going to proceed on to step 027 for the uh, OTE LRM Group 3. 
and OC. That script looks good. Your go to execute. Roger, executing. And OC, you are go to continue and enable ordinance cards. Copy, go to continue. OC, I can confirm both ordinance cards are enabled. You are go to continue with ordinance channel arms. Copy, go to continue. And OC, Julie. I can confirm both ordinance channels are armed and the SCS is enabled. All stations, all stations. The next command will fire OTE LRM Group 3. OC, you are go to fire. But we go to fire. So Julie, they're firing. Can you give us any commentary, yes. Thank you. Yeah, they're firing the launch release mechanisms for the optical telescope elements. That's the OTE LRM that they're talking about. Um, and what these are, are the uh, pins essentially in a holder um, that uh, restrain the mechanism during launch to make sure that, uh, you know, during the forces of, and vibration that we see that everything stays in position and doesn't put undue strain onto the motors or the uh, mechanisms themselves during that launch. And at this point, we're releasing them so that we can then move the mechanisms. So first we're going to release the mechanisms that keep this all in place. And then when can we expect yep. the, uh, uh, the secondary arm to actually begin to move? <laughs> uh, well, it will, it will, the very first move will be extremely small. Uh, so I am not sure that we will be able to discern it on the visualization tool. Um, but definitely once we get into the full move, we will, we will be able to see that. Um, and uh, the, the uh, once, once they, release those mechanisms, they'll want to take a moment and check out and make sure that everything is exactly what they want before they move and on. OC, so I verify prop complete. So at this time, we are going to proceed on to step 028 to release the OTE LRM group five. And OC, and here's, that script looks good. You are go to execute. Brian, here's executing. the next, the next launch release OC, being released. You are go to continue and enable ordinance cards. Stop the vote to continue. And at this time, what they're doing is they're running scripts that are made and tested well in advance. They're uh, tested on simulators. They're tested onto the real hardware when we're doing uh, ground test. And they've gone through these scripts that um, send up commands to OC, the spacecraft. can confirm both ordnance cards are enabled. So you are go to continue with ordnance channel arms. Copy, go to continue. And as we walk through the script very carefully with the deployments lead and the operation controller, um, uh, they, as you can hear, talk back and forth and very slowly walk through the script and the step and allowing the uh, commands to be sent up to the spacecraft as we move through it. Some things are checked automatically by the script and some things we wait for verification from the engineers on the ground before moving on. OC, I can confirm both ordnance channels are armed and the SCS is enabled. All stations, all stations, the next command will fire OTE LRM group five. OC, your go to fire. Copy, go to fire. You're watching live coverage of the deployment of the secondary mirror, an absolutely essential component of the James Webb Space Telescope. 
We are getting ready to extend secondary mirror in a few minutes from now. And when they say um, go to fire, what they're actually doing is um, they're putting a current through a, a brake wire that releases uh, a coiled wire that lets a, a, a cone and, and a, a cup assembly loosen and separate. You'll hear commentary from uh, uh, myself, Michelle Fowler. I uh, come to you from Goddard Space Flight Center. And OC, I can verify plot complete. At this time, we are going to execute 029 to configure the DEU to standby mode. And OC, that input looks good. You are going to execute. Copy, executing. And what they're doing OC, now is just putting, Copy, go to continue. putting the motor into standby while they get ready to do um, the next steps of the, of the deployments. And of course, the reason this is so uh, dramatic, you're looking at uh, something very historic here. This is the uh, the largest space observatory ever launched, the James Webb Space Telescope. And the, uh, um, the, the, the mirror assembly is so large, it had to be folded up. People often say like origami to fit into the rocket. We'll talk more about that later when we have some time as they're verifying the, uh, uh, the secondary mirror oh, deployment see, and also latching. Complete, and I can confirm the DEU is in standby mode. At this time, we are going to proceed on to step 030 to uh, execute the SAP parameter upload. Copy that. That is from the window. And OC, that looks good. You are good to execute. Executing. You're hearing commands from the Mission Operations Center, the mock. And OC, you are good to continue. Copy, go to continue. Yesterday saw the, the tremendous success of the uh, deployment of the giant heat shield to keep this a very cold infrared heat sensitive telescope. There's a gigantic five layered heat shield. Each layer is about the size of a, a tennis court. And uh, yesterday we were with you live for the uh, the finale of that as the, uh, the final layer was deployed and tensioned, pulled tight. It is now fully functional, fully uh, operational cooling the telescope as we speak. The telescope uh, components, the, mi the mirror will always be pointed away from the sun. And uh, as such, exposed to the, the cold vacuum of space will cool to temperatures close to minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And that has, has begun because the heat shield is, uh, is already Depops, doing this is that. Ops. This is Depops, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's just looking for you to confirm you've gotten joy this far with all your expectations. That's affirmative. We have been proceeding uh, as expected. Thank you. Some of the telemetry we see in the flight control room is different, so we didn't we didn't know what what you guys were all looking at. But that's good to hear. Thank you. And that was the voice of our mission operations manager as he was talking to the deployment team. His, uh, his acronym, obviously, is MOM, so you'll hear people call it to MOM, and sometimes that's a little surprising, uh, <laughs> but it stands for Mission Operations Manager. And Julie, you are the, uh, the Deputy Commissioning Engineer, and uh, also you were the Lead Systems Engineer for the, uh, the instrument package, I believe. Uh, maybe just, just give us a little introduction again as to who you are and your, 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 uh, your role on this mission. Sure. Um, so for uh, commissioning, there's there's it's breaking down into uh, several parts. Like the parts that we've done over the last 12 days is really focused on um, 
some of the spacecraft deployments, uh, getting the solar array out, getting the uh, communication system up and working, getting the sun shield out and tensioned. Um, and it's all been very, um, uh, a lot of intensive work on the on this team that built the spacecraft and the sun shield. Um, and then today is kind of marks a transition point. So today we, we switch gears and we work more onto the, onto the cold side on onto the optics and the optical telescope element and getting that deployed and set up for our optics. And then the, the final part of commissioning will be, we switch gears again, um, we'll go into the science instruments and getting them turned on and calibrated. Uh, so, so as our, so as our uh, commissioning is broken into these different segments, we have different people who kind of uh, oversee from a technical point what's going on and how things are going. So my expertise is more towards the more towards the telescope itself and the instruments, um, and then the uh, um, there's other people who have overseen <laughs> up to this point and. A little bit today, I want to give a quick shout out for the people who built the telescope and assembled it and done it. Uh, you know, I wasn't uh, directly involved with a lot of that, but as you can see, all those people are, are needed to be there in the control room, watching the data, be available if there's problems or questions. So I, I get to fill in today for the telescope um, and to talk about this. And uh, you'll probably hear from some more people along the way, Michelle as, as uh, different experts have more time and uh, availability to talk to you. Well, we're certainly happy to have you here, Julie. <laughs> we're looking at, again, we're looking at live coverage of the deployment of the secondary mirror for the James Webb Space Telescope, that should be happening in a few minutes from now. We're looking at uh, a, a real-time animation created by telemetry, that is data from the telescope. And then the other two windows are uh, live views of the Mission Operations Center. And as they uh, get ready here, I can watch my screen and, and uh, see what step they're on. They're, they're moving forward through, through their timeline um, and they're getting ready to uh, do a couple of setup steps with their motors and then they'll be moving on to doing their small mirror move to make sure that our, uh, the, uh, the uh, deployment motor, just a few degrees, actually 1.3 degrees out, to make sure that everything looks good before they do the full deployment. As we're talking, you'll, you'll occasionally uh, see us pause as we listen to commands from the Mission Operations Center. But uh, whenever we have a, a few minutes to, uh, to fill some time, Julie, one of the things that we talked about before was the fact that there are no actual cameras for us to see on web what the telescope is doing. And uh, that was something that was a, a deliberate decision. It, it, was, it was definitely thought about, but it, it, there, there are several things that make this very difficult to have cameras on this particular mission. I don't know if you'd like to go through some of that, but I, uh, I remember some of the reasons myself. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we would in this day and age, everything's caught on camera. Um, but, you know, realize that James Webb has been designed over many, many years. Um, we did look uh, at the possibility of adding some uh, cameras that would give us some views sim similar to this visual visualization tool. However, the, um, you know, the, the, the thing that the tool can do for us is, is, as you see right now, the mirrors are bright and shiny as though there's light shining on it. But the reality is out in space, it's dark. Uh, it would be like walking into a dark room and looking at the telescope, it would be dark. Um, so we would need some kind of uh, light system on a camera system. Uh, we would have problems if we wanted to do uh, flash photography, obviously our uh, mirror is very sensitive, our optics inside are very sensitive, and most importantly, our detectors all the way deep inside of our instruments. You know, we even looked at how sensitive they are to simply lights in the room. If uh, your fluorescent bulbs in the, in the clean room over years would degrade our detectors, we certainly don't want to be flashing them with a, with a flash for a camera. 
Um, the other thing is that, our, as you can see in our, visit, our uh, Where's Web Now tool, that we're getting colder and colder. So uh, a camera that you would that you would get that would work at those temperatures would have to be specially designed. You know, plastics fall apart and uh, they shrink and can crack. Uh, glues don't hold together. I mean, to make something that would work at the cryogenic temperatures on the cold side of the of the sun shield would take a lot of um, engineering and design. And then one other major issue is is that you know we would have to run cables and power uh, out to these cameras, um, and our our power balance, especially on the cold side of the telescope, is so delicate. Uh, you know, those would be essentially hot heat leaks, and we would not want to pick up the, the signature from those cables into the telescope optics itself and take a risk of... And OC, of, I can verify plot complete and all loads executed successfully. At this time, we are going to proceed on to step 031 to configure the DEU to operate frame 14. So okay, we would not the want those... And OC, cameras that to looks good. You're good to execute. Copy Optically. And or OC, you are good to continue. Copy or thermally. <laughs> Feel free to pause, Julie. Then we can come back. That's right, yes. Uh, and uh, last of all, you know, if, if the camera did fail, we would certainly not want the, the uh, debris from the camera to, to be moving around our telescope. Uh, you know, there's also two sides of the telescope. This is the side we're working on today, but um, for the earlier deployments, we would have had cameras uh, preferably on the hot side. But uh, as you can see, maybe in the video where the uh, observatory is moving away from the upper stage of the rocket, we're very shiny. So, um, and OC, we, I can verify rock complete, and the DEU is in operate mode, frame 14. Stand by for depth lead verification. Copy, copy, stand by. And to have a camera to do anything useful with, with that bright of a background would be very difficult too. It, you know, it's a little bit of a like um, a hall of mirrors with the with the shiny surfaces. You know, what would you look at to to be able to distinguish what's going on? So, from an engineering perspective, we we decided that it, our telemetry coming down was the most reliable thing that we have. But when we did see the um, the solar array deploy it from the camera from the uh, upper stage, that was really quite exciting for us. Yeah, th this was amazing. So what you're looking at here on the screen is is the actual footage of the observatory uh, leaving the Ariane 5 rocket. Uh, you see the logo of the European Space Agency. They were the uh, providers of the Ariane 5. And uh, as the James Webb Space Telescope is, they're flying off independently into space. Our, our last view of it, uh, one of the things we were able to see is the, uh, the the solar array deploying, and so that was uh, that was amazing. I was not expecting that, and uh, there were so many cheers and so many smiles as we uh, as we saw that heading off into space. Uh, Webb is going about a million miles away. It is going to a Lagrange point. That is a point where the gravity of the uh, the Earth and the uh, the Sun and the Moon balance. It's a great place to actually uh, to park a spacecraft. It's, uh, everything kind of balances and keeps there. The solar array that you see deploying right now, if, if you look over at the at web going off into space, you see the solar array deploying. That was the first of its uh, deployments that allowed the spacecraft to power itself up. And uh, we are now very, very much involved in the rest of the deployments. Yesterday, we had the incredible finale of the uh, the giant sunscreen successfully deploying. And today, we are looking for the secondary mirror, the focusing mirror to deploy. There will be deployments and commissioning for quite a while. Uh, the major ones will be completed all about uh, 29 days after launch. Nice, uh, nice little dramatic lens flare <laughs> there from the uh, the sunlight hitting the back of the James Webb Space Telescope as it goes off into space. So, Michelle, as I listen to oh, what's yeah. going on here, they they're in the process of doing their small move, which, like I said, I don't believe we'll be able to detect on the uh, visualization tool. Uh, but they're waiting for confirmation from the uh, deployment lead that the, the move has stopped. 
So at this point, all of the latching mechanisms have been uh, released so that the, the, the mirror has actually been released. And now we're waiting for a small move, you know, to check and see that everything's all right. And then uh, later on in the broadcast, the, uh, the deployment of the secondary mirror. And we will be with you through the deployment and then also through the latching as, as the uh, secondary mirror is, is latched solidly into place. And we know that the secondary mirror has been successfully deployed. We expect the uh, the latching to take place. Uh, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that will be about 45 minutes after the deployment of the, the mirror. Is, is that process will be complete? Yes. Yeah, the latching has a has a couple of steps. They move through it slowly. They want to make sure that everything's in its precise position so that um, once it's latched, it's completely, we do not come back and ever adjust this again. Oh, they must have gotten confirmation that that the small move was successful. I see celebration. <laughs> what you're looking at is live footage. Uh, this is happening right now at the mock, the Mission Operations Center. You're looking at the, uh, the the deployment of the secondary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope, an absolutely essential component. Oh, see, that bot sign ups. This is Austin. Go ahead. Step lead has confirmed we have positive separation, so we are going to proceed on to step 037 to stop the DU motor. Copy that. That is on the window. And OC, that looks good. You're good to execute. Copy, execute. And OC, you are good to continue. Copy, go to continue. You can just hear the excitement and the voices of the people on the floor as they're announcing the success of this this first small move because this is you know uh, once this small move is seen to be successful. Step up, copy, uh, and I can confirm the DU motor has stopped. But this time we are going to proceed on to step zero three eight to configure the DU to standby mode. Copy that. That's on the window. And OC, the command line looks good. You're good to execute. Copy executing. And OC, you are good to continue. Copy, go to continue. So now they'll go ahead and get ready to do the full deployment. But the small move gave them so much confidence in, in the, uh, the motor doing its job and the uh, mechanisms working and, and moving, uh, just as expected. So they're coming into this next uh, major deployment with a lot of confidence. As we were saying, there are no live cameras on the web telescope for many I good can reasons. Confirm, <laughs> complete, and the DU is in standby mode. So at this time, we are going to proceed on to step 039 for the integral gain SAP parameter update. Let's take copy, just on the window, please concur. And OC, that looks good. You are going to execute. Copy, executing. And OC, you are going at... to continue. Copy, go to continue. What you're looking at on the left-hand side of your screen is the uh, observatory visualization tool. And actually, we have a question from social media. There is a, a devil on Twitch uh, that says, uh, will this observatory visualiz visualization tool be made available to the public? And uh, Julie, I, I believe this is something people can, can follow along with uh, on some of the websites. Uh, is that correct? I think people are putting out uh, information on the website, and I think uh, you can you can get different updates, but I don't think the tool itself is available. Right. If that's what they're asking. Right. You can go to the website, uh, where is Webb? And uh, there's lots of information as to where exactly Webb is on its path out to L2, the Lagrange point, a million miles away from Earth, as well as the temperature. You can uh, actually see in real time uh, the different temperatures on the, the sun side of the telescope and the, the cool side of the telescope. And we were talking yeah, about the sensitivity. The Please go ahead, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about we were talking about the the uh, different temperatures on the cold side of the sun shield here, 
uh, and you know, even in our visualization tool here, you can kind of get an idea. Anything that's down close to that sun shield is going to run a little bit warmer because there is there is some heat that comes through. There is some heat that gets reflected up into it. There's a, a essentially a hole through the center of the the sun shield that has all of the structure and cable running oh. down to the hot side of the spacecraft. DevOps copies, and I can confirm the load was executed successfully. So at this time, we are going to proceed onto step 040 to configure the DEU to operate frame 14. And OC, that command line looks good. We are go to execute. They're getting ready. They're getting ready. Uh, and OC, to you have a go to continue. Here. Copy, go to continue. Um, the, we were talking about the temperatures uh, of the items closer to the sun shield being warmer than the stuff away from the sun shield. And as you can see, the, the secondary mirror itself being perched on top of the, of the telescope at the moment is, is one of our colder items, even when it gets deployed out. Yeah. Oh, there's a great picture. You can see that the secondary mirror here is at the top of your screen on the dark side, on the cold side. Um, and it does run. It does not have its own radiator, but it runs very cold. Um, the it's one of the colder items on on that side, uh, and the sun shield itself is basically what keeps it cold, and the fact that it really doesn't generate any heat itself. Here we when go. You think about the temp. Here we go. Yeah. Did you stop people? Hey. Step lead has confirmed we are ready to proceed with the SMSS deploy. So at this time, we are going to proceed on to step 042 for the SMSS motor move. Okay. You're looking at live coverage, the deployment of the secondary mirror, an essential component for the James Webb Space Telescope. That command line looks good. You are good to execute. Copy, go to execute. <laughs> and OC, you are good to continue. Roger, go to continue. And OC, stand by for verification. Standing by. Julie, can you tell us what SMSS means, the acronym that we're hearing? Sure, that's a second mirror. Those parameters look good. We are go to move the SMSS motor. Project, <laughs> that's, that's the secondary mirror support structure. And it's a four bar linkage. Uh, you'll see it kind of uh, unfold here kind of uh, almost looks a little uh, like from a high tech movie but uh, it will move in a linkage assembly out until the joint in the middle of the top uh, leg gets into position so there's there's hinges at the bottom and there's a hinge at the mirror on the short leg and then there's a hinge in the center of the shorter leg and then a hinge at the top, very top of the mirror, and the two short legs fold into one long leg. One coming attraction for this broadcast is that uh, once they extend the secondary mirror, there'll be about a 45 minute period uh, where they latch the mirror, where they, they make sure that it's very strongly uh, and solidly put together. And uh, during that 45 minutes, we'll be able to show you some, uh, some, some footage of the actual testing and building of the secondary mirror. It's uh, surprisingly large. <laughs> so those booms that are extending from it, uh, Julie, you may know this offhand, and if you don't, uh, when, when the booms are extended, about how far away is the secondary mirror from the primary mirror? <laughs> oh, I should have looked that up. Yeah, the uh, well, one of the privileges I had uh, working at Goddard Space Flight Center was was watching uh, tests like this, and I, I did see the secondary mirror deployed, and it was it was it was it was. It was to me, it seemed like it was perhaps nearly two stories away from the uh, uh, the primary mirror, and uh, it's a uh, it, it, it's a, it's a spectacular thing to see. And, and and like I said, after after we have uh, confirmation that this is that this event is concluded, uh, we will then be latching. We'll have some, about 45 minutes to talk more about and this. And OC DevOps on ops. Uh, this motor move takes about 11 minutes, and we'll give uh, periodic updates. Yes, yeah, so here you can see the telemetry coming in at the top of the screen that the the visualization tool is using to recalculate the position of these this mechanism, and it's a little hard to see with the black background on with the black tubes, but you can if you look carefully at the top, you can start to see the mechanism start to unfold. 
this is this is tremendously exciting to me. So you know, as, as this observatory is on its way to its uh, its its uh, resting point a million miles away, this this huge secondary mirror configuration is is now deploying, and uh, I can I can see that the uh, the bars are changing on our our observatory visualization tool, which is based on real live data from the observatory, and the uh, the secondary mirror is deploying. This procedure will take about 11 minutes. About 10 minutes from now, we should uh, see the uh, the secondary mirror on our visualization tool fully deployed. The last few days have seen some of the most dramatic deployments uh, from the, the Webb Observatory. Yesterday, of course, the uh, spectacular finale of deploying the giant heat shield. And today, the secondary mirror. And as you can see, uh, the secondary mirror is now moving away from the primary mirror. I understand it's a little bit dark in the animation, sort of bl black bars on the black background. But we can see the movement. We can see that this is beginning. So the um, mechanism that's actually lifting and, and uh, rotating this in position is at the top of the mirror there, uh, is, is where the motor is located that actually does the deployment. Um, and we have a photograph on the screen of our mission operation manager, Carl Starr. He's up in the, in the top camera shot. So, as you can see, it's a bright sunny day in Baltimore, which makes it a little hard to see people in the room, in the uh, flight control room in the top uh, box there. But um, uh, it's great to have it's great to have good weather while we're doing this. <laughs> Carl Starr is the you'll, you'll hear the acronym the MOM, the Mission Operations Manager. And you are looking at live coverage of the this deployment is, uh, of the secondary complete mirror. Complete on ops with the status. We're about halfway through the deployment. Currents are looking really good, uh, um, lower than we saw in the ground testing, and everything's looking nominal. So we've got about five more minutes to five or six more minutes to get to the hard stops. Oh, right at that. Thank you for the day. There's a nice view on our uh, observatory visualization tool. So you see this giant boom taking the secondary mirror, the focusing mechanism for the James Webb Space Telescope. The primary mirror are, are those gold segments that you see. There are 18 gold segments. And uh, after we have uh, confirmation that the mirror has been deployed, <clears throat> we'll have some time to look at uh, how those will be focused. That will be another major commissioning activity for the James Webb Space Telescope in the next weeks. This is the largest and most sensitive space observatory ever flown. It had to be actually folded up to fit inside a rocket. Uh, this is something that is uh, historic. We have not done this before where things need to be unfolded to this extent. So this is uh, this is very dramatic. There are people all over the world <laughs> so happy that things so far are going well and, uh, and wishing for a successful deployment. I know that I have uh, friends of mine who've worked on the, the web telescope since uh, about 1995. So this is many, many decades of, of people's work and life all happening right in front of you live as we watch that secondary mirror deploy. And some of the things that are unique about this is the operation of these um, joints in space and at such a cold temperature. Um, we do have a few heaters 
that we warm up the motors and uh, some of the, the mechanism components. But for the most part, the joints have uh, to work in the cold environment of space, which takes special design and special coatings. Um, and as you can see, they also are quite close to our mirrors. So we have to be careful about contamination. This is also the you first time to, to do this deployment in zero gravity. Every other time that we've done the deployment in uh, in a clean room, we've had to to have gravity considerations. So this is the first time doing it in zero gravity. We were talking about that yesterday with the uh, non-explosive actuators. All of these little pins that need to release to unfold different parts of the uh, the telescope. And uh, again, those uh, you know those, those those were all tested uh, on the Earth, where you weren't not you were not not in zero gravity. They needed to work in space. And Julie, I don't know about you, but every every time I see that mirror move a little bit farther in our uh, visualization tool, I'm getting more and more excited. My, my my heart is starting to beat faster and faster. There's <laughs> for me, there's a tremendous amount of joy. I mean, I, I have this this smile like on my face from ear to ear right now, as I uh, as I see this this absolutely essential component of the James Webb Observatory via the secondary mirror, the focusing mechanism deploy. Yes, without this without this mirror in its right position, we do not get light into the telescope. And all of those actuators, all of those pins that needed to uh, release in order to unfold this. Um, Julie, can you, can you give me an idea? I, I believe there's, there's over, is, is, are there over 300 of those? Yeah. There's different kinds and different types around. So it's kind of every time you'll read something, it will tell you a slightly different number, but it all depends on what category they count them in. Um, and for this, this, what we watched today, there was three different ones that we released. So there is so much of that now behind us. There was a lot of work over the years to make sure that these devices worked and then, then all the different configurations that we needed them in and the different sizes to make sure that they all work and they all work reliably. They're very much like a, a parachute. They're, they're very sensitive to how they're wrapped and how they're handled. Um, you know, you get one chance to do it right. And if you test it and it works, that doesn't mean that you've done the next one right. So you have to package each one just perfectly. And we're coming very close to being fully deployed. As you can see the, the top of the, um, of the mechanism, the two bars there coming closer and closer to their final position of, of being in line with each other. And you can, from this orientation, you can now see uh, that, the, that the mirror side of the secondary uh, has the gold coating on it too in the visualization tool. Well, the Webb Observatory uh, is a, a very large mirror. It's a tiny amount of gold. Uh, I, I believe it's just a, a couple gold rings worth of gold across the whole thing, just a couple hundred atoms thick on the, on the surfaces. Yep. Gold was chosen because it is, it is wonderfully reflective in the infrared. Uh, this is a heat sensitive telescope, infrared light, and also gold uh, is very stable and, and doesn't, uh, unlike something like silver, uh, doesn't react chemically very much. So it's a very good thing to use when nobody can go out there to, uh, to clean your mirrors. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's all on its own. So as the, as the mechanism continues to unfold here, the motor will drive it into a hard stop. And from that, then they will start working on the latching procedure. So we will first wait for confirmation that the mirror is fully deployed. And then after that, as they uh, go through the latching procedure, we'll have some time to, uh, to talk to our host a bit about the, uh, the testing and the building of the secondary mirror. We already have a, a lot of questions coming in through social media. We should have time to get to some of them. But if you'd like to have your question answered, just go to so hashtag AskNASA. And we have uh, deployed into the hard stops. So we'll move into yeah. capturing the latches and then recentering. All right, as you heard, that went completely into the hard stop. And we'll take a little bit of time to take a, to, uh, take a look at their telemetry put the motor into a standby mode, and then move into the latching sequences. So Julie, at Actually, this point, the mirror- motor At this point, I'm sorry, I misspoke. 
they will actually keep the tension on the motor at this point while they do the latching. So as they are starting latching, uh, I think, the, so th at this point, the, the mirror mechanism has been fully deployed. Is, is, is that correct, Julie? Yep, the mechanism is oh, fully she, deployed. The motor not. is holding it. No. Did Hard stop okay. while they do the latching. I have confirmed with Deploy that we are ready to proceed with the ADU latch moves. At this time, we are going to proceed onto step 044 to enable SES 256. Copy that. That is on the window. And OC, and that can... looks good. You are go to execute. Copy executing. And you heard the term ADU. That's uh, the motor that drives the actuator. And OC, you are going to ADU. enable activate SCS 256. Copy go to enable and activate 256. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, you're looking at the, uh, the live coverage of the commissioning of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, today, the main task is deploying and now latching the secondary mirror assembly. And uh, that is uh, absolutely essential for the telescope to operate and to be able to focus light onto its gigantic primary mirror. And over on the left side of the screen, you're seeing a, uh, a visualization produced by real-time data from the telescope. And then above us, you see uh, live uh, footage from the mission control, uh, the, the MOC, the Mission Operations Center in uh, the Johns Hopkins and University. And OC, I verify plot complete, and 256 is enabled and activated in slot two. I'll take copy. The uh, latching that's going to come and up. And OC, I have confirmed with Dep Lead that we are ready to perform the first latch off stow move. So at this time, we're going to proceed on to step 046. So uh, latch off stow one of three. Copy that. And OC, that looks good. You are go to execute. Roger, executing. And OC, you are go to continue. Copy, go to continue. The latches on this that they're discussing now um, is a is a hook latch, kind of like uh, you would have on the possibly a bathroom door uh, that is, <laughs> but obviously very highly uh, specialized for this operation. And it will, the deployment motor, the actuator motor, will come in and put that latch on top of, uh, of a, a hard stop. And then the motor will pull down to, to put a preload into the, and into the structure. And then the deployment motor will release its, its push off against the hard stop. So as we look at uh, the live coverage of this event, um, we are going to occasionally stop conversation to listen to comments from the MOC, the Mission Operations Center. But uh, as we are now awaiting the latch procedure, which will take about uh, 45 minutes, we're told, uh, we have a time to look at uh, some of the, the actual instrumentation as it was built and tested at Goddard Space Flight Center. So um, I believe uh, we're going to be looking at some footage of the delivery of the secondary mirror support structure. And here we have the secondary mirror. Julie, can you tell us what we're looking at in this, uh, in this footage we have? Sure. So as you can kind of see here, that uh, silver stainless piece is a, is a cover. And then the mirror itself is on a dolly with wheels. And we have engineers and technicians in what we call lovingly as bunny suits in a clean room, and this is, I believe, at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, doing the initial inspection as they open up the shipping container of the mirror. And now here it looks like we have the mirror up onto the uh, crane and the mechanism to move it up into position where we're going to then do the installation. And here's the people at Goddard watching <laughs> from the observatory area as the whole uh, assembly takes place. And this is the structure that we were just seeing deployed. You can see it kind of across the middle of your screen, the, the big booms. And this kind of gives you a perspective of how large in diameter those booms are. You know, they're, they're uh, um, quite substantial. They, they look so small in relative to the telescope. But here you can see as we, 
as we deploy it. Here we do it in a horizontal orientation. And they're white there because they have some plastic uh, protective coatings on it. Uh, kind of like you would uh, get something shipped in the mail. It's wrapped in plastic bubble wrap. Oh, somebody's got their hand on the camera. There we go. Um, and so uh, you saw two pictures of, of, or actually three different videos of it being deployed. One was as it was being assembled at Goddard in in the clean room, and that one was done in a vertical orientation. And then the other two tests were done in a horizontal orientation. Uh, the one that was done in a vertical orientation, uh, you could see from the from the top of the picture, and it's a, uh, a little, goes by quickly, but you can see we did some gravity offloading. And then in the horizontal uh, uh, orientation, the gravity offloading was a little different. But testing it in the different orientations is a big part yeah, of how we count the gravity. Uh, this motor move has completed successfully, and DevLead has confirmed we are go to proceed with the last two safe, move two of three. Copy from the window. And OC, that looks good. You are go to execute. Roger, executing. And OC, you are go to continue. Copy, go to continue. And actually, we had a question from uh, Darren on Twitter that asked if the secondary mirror was uh, uh, coated with gold, the same as the primary mirror. And uh, and, and yes, uh, we, uh, we they, they they both are, are coated with gold because of their that wonderful reflective property in the infrared. So, um, Julie, one of the things that was going on right now is latching. So, you know, now now that the secondary mirror has been fully extended, they're they're latching it into place. Um, I believe we have an animation about the latching and what's going on right now. So if oh. our, uh, there we go, you could maybe talk to this animation. Sure, so you can see that the bottom two booms are fixed um, and the top one has a, has a uh, joint in the center and that latch is right there at that center joint. Um, and as you come in close, they don't have the details of the latch itself. It's kind of buried in that structure, um, but it, Right in there, there's a hook latch that comes over to essentially a, 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 a hard stop, and then it can can pull on that hard stop, almost like a tie down type of latch. Go to continue with more the, the uh, and we were talking a bit. The, of, we were talking a bit about testing. Oh, sorry, we were talking a bit about testing and how this uh, you know has to now function in zero gravity. When before we were looking at footage being tested on Earth. And actually, we um, we even had a question that from somebody called Pocket Moon on Twitter. It says, how much do the engineers have to account for operating zero G versus one G? What were some of the things that during the testing that you know, how how is it that you had confidence this works in zero gravity when we can only test it in gravity? Well, the the nice thing about gravity um, is it it's in one orientation. So if you want to account for it, you can kind of um, do things in multiple orientations and take the average and figure out how to subtract it out. So as you can see here, we did tests in different directions. We did testing to the left, we did testing to the right, we did testing upright, um, and Motor we can figure out exactly progress. what's happening and exactly how gravity impacts okay. us um, and uh, take that into account. Same thing with thermal. Uh, there's a lot of thermal impacts. We wanna make sure that uh, you know we're testing it, as you can see right there in the clean room, but in space, we're gonna be much, much colder. So we want to make sure that that mirror is in the right position when we were both in zero gravity and cold. So we did a lot of measurements, both at ambient and cryogenic temperatures to make sure that when we account for both of those effects together, that we wind up in this in the right spot. And that's a really amazing thing to, uh, to think about that uh, this telescope's operating temperature is nearly 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And so, you know, I'm sure that, you know, people are familiar a little in their daily life that, that objects uh, change properties when they are very cold or very warm. So <clears throat> the mirror itself is actually not the correct curvature, uh, each mirror segment, until we come down to the operating temperature of the telescope. So uh, this is something that from the, you know, the very moment it was designed, we knew that building it and testing it on Earth, we had to be very careful to make sure that everything worked in its real environment in space. And uh, Julie, the, the um, we actually have some uh, footage, I believe, we can talk about the light path and why the secondary mirror is important. So as we said, this is absolutely essential, the extension of this, this focusing mirror. 
So I believe we have uh, some animation. If you could uh, talk to this, Julie. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see like a, a rather large beam of light coming in from space. It hits the primary mirror, reflects off, reflects off of that. The primary mirror is um, concave and it reflects back. And if you run that again, you'll see that it, the, the beam is shaped and reflect back to the secondary, which is convex, and then pushes it down through the center of the telescope here. Um, and that is called our aft optics. And it looks like a little nose in the middle of the telescope. And it actually has a couple more uh, optical features in it. It has a mask that you can see that the, that the light crisscrosses right as it goes through that mask. And then it has a mirror in the back uh, that you can kind of almost see a re-image of what the telescope uh, pupil looks like on that. The pupil is the outside of the telescope. Um, and our telescope is a tricontagon shaped when it's fully, the wings are fully deployed. And that mirror has that same pattern on it. Um, and then it comes back and it hits a tertiary mirror, which then reflects it backwards into the, into the cameras that live behind the telescope itself. Um, and so this is the important the, thing. The, the, the instrument package is all behind the primary mirror, and uh, this will allow yes. the light to actually go into the uh, the telescope. Yes. Yes. So, you know, uh, just like your telescope on the ground, uh, there's essentially a, a, a somehow to capture the light. Since we we don't go up there and, and look through the telescope ourselves, we need to have cameras behind the telescope, which take all the images for us. Um, so it would be uh, um, it would be unfortunate to have like this entire telescope and just have one camera available. So what happens behind that is the is the light uh, beam gets distributed between the four different instruments. So each instrument gets a portion of that beam and then uses their own internal optics to uh, shape and uh, control that beam and filter that beam in different ways before it hits the detector of those instruments, uh, which then the science data comes down to you. Oh, and here's uh, one of um, one of our instruments, and you can kind of see that it's a uh, it, it's on some spindly legs. The stuff that's putting itself out to the right and the left is uh, is the legs, and here's the beam of light that comes in and is folded into the instrument and then it is folded again and then once again it's folded this is our near spec um, and then it comes through a wall and it's into now into the optics and into the camera into the back you can see the filter wheel spinning there actually i'm not sure that this is near spec <laughs> these are different instruments that are in the uh the ice and the instrument package uh, some of the most uh, sensitive cameras see it. made. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 This is Miri. Okay. Which is which is very similar in its uh, its four optics there. Apologies. Apologies, Miri. <laughs> We actually have a very good question from uh, Sally Sparks on Twitter, who asks, um, "How you know, how are the steps verified?" I mean, we've been we've been listening to the mock today, the Mission Operations Center, and you know, they they say well, so is, this is verified, the engines are on. How are we getting that information? So we get uh, telemetry. Um, what we have on the on the telescope is a whole series of sensors of different kinds. We have. Uh, sensors that are position sensors, we have sensors that are current sensors, we have sensors that are temperature sensors, um, uh, and all that telemetry gets fed in through the computers and then brought down through the, the communication system into a ground station, gets sent over to our operation center here in Baltimore, and the um, uh, comes out on our computer screens. And uh, as you, if you remember looking at the mock, a lot of those screens are, you have four screens there and there's all different um, information. Each of those engineers are looking at a different aspect of what's going on. So they'll each have different pieces of information and telemetry coming up that they're checking out. Um, and they can take a look at that and they can look at the, at the status um, and the telemetry coming back to get those verifications.
So for our audience joining us, you're looking at live coverage of the deployment of the secondary mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is a, a second day of very dramatic and successful deployments. Yesterday saw the, uh, the full installation of the giant heat shield, and today we have the focusing mechanism, the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror has been fully deployed, and at this point they are now latching it. So um, we actually have a question from um, uh, Manuel on Twitter that says, um, why is Webb built to see in specific and longer wavelengths than Hubble? And why didn't you mount shorter wavelength lenses like UV, X-rays, et cetera? So this, this might give me a little chance to talk about some of the science behind Webb and also why it's an infrared observatory. So um, to, to answer the question, um, different wavelengths of light require very different uh, observatories. Basically, there's no way to build one telescope that can capture all the wavelengths of light. And you see here that infrared light is the color of light that is a bit redder than our eyes detect. Um, you see that there is an area of this, what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. The, the electromagnetic spectrum is simply a name for all of the different forms that light takes. And our eyes are only sensitive to a very small range of that, which we call rather obviously visible light. There are higher energy forms of light that are basically too blue, too high energy, uh, the UV light, gamma rays, and X-rays. And um, NASA does operate telescopes that, that see in all these different wavelengths, but you need very, very different kinds of instruments and different kinds of mirrors. Um, uh, for example, we have uh, the, the Chandra X-ray Observatory up right, right now that sees in X-rays. X-rays are a very high energy type of light, and uh, as you sort of know, you know, colloquially from the doctor's offices, X-rays go right through your body. And uh, X-rays, of course, would go right through most detectors and mirrors. You need very specialized detectors. Infrared light is lower energy light. And uh, we, we, we often experience this as humans as a form of, of heat, heat light. Uh, infrared light, infrared radiation. The, the reason we, we sort of associated it with heat is that objects that are the temperature of a human body uh, you know, and you know, the temperature, for example, of a planet like Earth, uh, they naturally glow in these lower energy types of light. So the sun is so hot, you know, the surface temperature of the sun about 10,000 degrees, it's hot enough to actually glow, and uh, that produces visible light. But objects that are just warm, really have any temperature at all, they are glowing in infrared light. And uh, we had many successful infrared telescopes. The Hubble Space Telescope did see a little bit into the infrared. And we see here uh, an image taken by Hubble in visible light of the famous pillars of creation. These are dust clouds that are many hundreds of billions of miles across. And they are forming new stars and solar systems inside them. And you see here the optical light. But if we switch to infrared light, um, Hubble had an instrument called NICMOS that saw a little bit into the infrared. Uh, this is, these are both actual images. These are both real data. But this infrared image is one their eyes do not see. The uh, information has been translated into colors that we can actually interpret and, and, and make this image with. But all of those stars that you see in this image were really there in the visible light image, just not visible in the kind of light that our eye sees. Infrared light has the ability to pass through dust and a lot of obscuring material. And there are some really fascinating things that happen inside these giant dust clouds. So we mentioned the formation of stars and planets. And uh, this is one of the most active regions of star formation in our part of the galaxy. This is the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is actually visible as a faint smudge below the belt of Orion in what we call the sword of Orion. There are sort of three stars that hang down from the belt of Orion. This is the middle quote unquote star. It's not a star, actually. It's a collection of many hundreds of young stars and planetary systems that are forming inside a vast cloud of dust and gas. And uh, while we can see inside the nebula a little bit where the Orion Nebula is visible to us, it's a much larger complex. And uh, we can see through that, that dust using infrared. We mentioned the MIRI instrument and also spectroscopes. This is one of the things that's a very powerful way to analyze light. So what a, what a spectroscope does, a spectrograph, I should say, is, is actually pass light through a prism and break it up into the components of the rainbow, all the different colors of the rainbow. Now, we can actually tell really exciting things from measuring very, very carefully how much color comes from each, uh, how, much, how much light comes in each color of the rainbow. That's called spectroscopy. And spectroscopy allows you to do things like discover what the components are made of. And here we see, so here we see a beam of white light again. And it's being passed through, uh, in this case, a prism. 
uh, on a telescope, it's usually a grating that does the same thing. It spreads it out into a rainbow. And the graph shows you how much light is coming in different colors. Wherever you see this kind of squiggly line go down, that means less light in that color. Um, the, the reason that's interesting is that every chemical in the universe, basically, every atom, every molecule, has a fingerprint of light that that specific molecule absorbs. And that's how we're able to tell you what stars are made of, what, what planets that are around other stars, you know, what the composition of their atmospheres may be. This is one of the big deals about the Webb Observatory. One of the major goals is to see, do planets around other stars have environments like the Earth with water vapor, carbon dioxide, oxygen? And the way Webb is gonna determine that is by watching that planet move in front of the star and the star light behind it will pass through the atmosphere of that planet. And as that does, different components will be absorbed because we know the absorption characteristics of all of these uh, different chemicals like oxygen, like water vapor. And as that light reaches the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to say, all right, there's a planet going around that star in the sky that has an atmosphere very much like the Earth. And these are some of the signals that we're looking for. Another reason infrared is so important is that some of the most important signal, signals of this absorption take place in the infrared. If you'd like to know, for example, if there's water vapor, if there's oxygen, uh, not only that, we should be able to have some idea of the temperature of the atmosphere and maybe the density of the atmosphere. And so but the hope is that once Webb is operational and looking at exoplanets, plants around other stars, we will be able to say that planet has an atmosphere very much like the Earth and uh, perhaps even might even have biomarkers, the, uh, the, the signals of vegetation. Uh, that's less likely. The first thing we'll be looking for is just to find atmospheres that are like the Earth. Uh, these are animations, uh, scientific visualizations uh, made of exoplanets. Of course, exoplanets are so far away, we can't yet see whether they have oceans or atmospheres, but uh, that these are based on scientific uh, data around a star called TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 is a star that we are uh, looking at with the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, TRAPPIST-1 we now know has at least seven planets. And uh, of those seven Earth-sized planets that were detected, there are several of them that are about the right distance from the star to have temperatures similar to the Earth. And uh, that's all we know right now is we know the rough size of these planets. We know that they're dense. They are rocky planets like the Earth and Mars and Venus in our inner solar system, but we do not have any information yet about what their atmospheres are like. And hopefully that will change when the Webb telescope is able to, uh, to send us back information about these exoplanets. That's one of the major science goals of the Webb telescope. You see here some of the, uh, the exoplanets, uh, again, imagined by our scientific visualizers. We don't have this data yet, but, uh, but hopefully in the next decades, we'll be able to tell you uh, a little bit about, uh, this, is, uh, this is the TRAPPIST system, TRAPPIST-1. The way that we find exoplanets is by watching planets transit in front of their sun. They block out a little bit of the starlight, basically a tiny little solar eclipse as these planets move in front. And uh, as the planets move in front uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope, we should also have the opportunity to watch the background starlight of their, of their parent star shine through their atmospheres. And when that happens during a transit, Webb will have the power to analyze the chemistry, possibly the temperature and the density of these atmospheres and determine whether any of these planets have atmospheres that are friendly to light. And that's what you see here in this diagram. You see a, an exoplanet in this animation moving in front of its star, uh, according to our, our field of view. And different layers of the atmosphere uh, will actually absorb different things, different wavelengths of light in the infrared. And so we'll be able to actually explore what the environments of these planets are like, even from this far away. All right, well, uh, let's go back to the, uh, the Mission Operations Center. Let's, uh, let's find out what's going on. All stations, this is Mama on Ops. All stations, this is Mama on Ops. As we look at this telescope, we're going to listen to the PM right now. All stations, listen to the PM. Thank you, Carl. Hey, I just wanted to take a moment to congratulate everyone. Another banner day for JWST. In particular, the secondary mirror deployment folks. You guys did a heck of a job. This is unbelievable. We are now at a point where we're, as I looked up before, we're about 600,000 miles from Earth, and we actually have a telescope. So congratulations to everybody. All right. So that was Bill Oaks, our pro program manager. <laughs> Congratulating everyone on the operations loop. You're seeing some high fives there. 
And what they've done while we were off talking about exoplanets is they confirmed that the latch had latched and took off the tension from the deployment motor. Um, they will continue to do a little bit to make sure that it's perfectly aligned. We'll see that exactly up but this is a major deployment and it is locked into place. This is tremendously this is important. Go ahead. Uh, so at this time, we are ready to proceed whenever you are. Copy that. Quick, quickly, they have to stop celebrating and continue to work. That is on the window. Please concur. Step ops copies. OC, we are going to proceed with step 053 to command the DU to stand by. And that looks good. You are going to execute. Copy. Executing. And OC, you are going to continue. Copy. Go to continue. So you'll hear us talking. You'll, you'll occasionally hear us pause as we listen to uh, commentary from the, the Mission Operations Center. So Julie, um, I mean, after today's you know wonderful and successful deployment of this secondary mirror, um, a little bit of a look ahead to what's happening next. And uh, tomorrow, I believe we have another uh, significant deployment. The aft radi radiator will deploy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I think. Oh, here's our animation. So this is on the back side of the telescope, on actually behind the instruments. And you could see right there on the one side of the screen was actually the uh, the mirrors deploying out of the way. But the the this is a radiator that takes some heat from the um, electronics and all the things that still have to operate on the cold side of the telescope and and directs that heat out into deep space to, to dump that power out where it doesn't reflect around and get back into the telescope. These instruments are designed to operate at very cold temperatures. And after that, uh, we actually now have the deployment of the wings of the uh, the main mirror. So, so what will be happening in the next few days, as you see here, is that the two sides of the mirror, the mirror had to be folded up to fit inside the rocket. This is the largest space observatory ever built. It had to be folded up to fit inside a rocket. They are now deploying it. And um, I believe we have footage of the, the test of the mirrors in the clean room where it was assembled. So uh, if, we, if we have that footage to run, Julie, you could maybe comment on what's going on here. <laughs> well, this is back to the secondary deployment that we're doing here. Again, the secondary deployment in a different gravity orientation. And then one last time, uh, in different views, you can see the mirror. Here's the wing coming out. Um, and as you see this, you can see that there's like a, a, a black, uh, uh, we call it the frill around the outside of the mirrors. It's kind of like an Elizabethan collar. Um, and, and what that does is it actually prevents starlight from behind the telescope from passing close to the telescope and actually hitting the secondary mirror and working its way into the optus itself. So that's actually soft structure. It's a, it's a blanket-like material made out of capton um, that's a real low reflectivity and it keeps the light from, from uh, poking its head around the backside of the, of the mirrors and making its way in. And here you can see a technician or an engineer taking a close look as we close to make sure everything's happening just perfectly. And behind that, you can see people on things we call diving boards. We had to do a lot of work high up in the sky to, to you know, the telescope is so big, you couldn't be standing on the ground and doing the work on it. So our technicians got good at um, being up high on, on uh, cranes and on diving boards, we call them. And you can see that they had fall protection to make sure that uh, that they didn't fall, their tools had to be uh, tethered copies, to make sure they didn't drop anything. It's a lot the, uh, of load work in the clean room in so those suits time, long hours. So for, to command the DE for us here in the mode, frame 14. For us here in the clean room, that's uh, where And the OC, operation. that looks good. You are go to execute. Copy, executing. And we have to wear masks because of COVID. But that's nothing compared to working in those suits all day in the clean room. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my kudos to all the people who work so hard all that time to put it together. We we shouldn't complain at all wearing our COVID masks. Right. Well, so to to, to wrap up today's broadcast, um, we have had uh, live coverage of the successful deployment of the secondary mirror, the focusing structure of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is an absolutely essential component of the observatory, and I am smiling, and I was very excited to see this happen. Uh, joining me has been uh, Julie Van Camp. She is the, uh, the Deputy Commissioning Engineer 
uh, and also the uh, uh, the main system engineer for the the, the instrument package. A very historic day. So um, this uh, this particular observatory will take about uh, 29 days to fully deploy. After that, it will cool down, uh, and we will actually have to wait a few months for the uh, the first images because of cooling down. But so far, everything has gone absolutely wonderfully. And and OC, that input looks good. You are go to execute. Copy that. Executing. And OC, you are go to continue. Copy, go to continue. And OC, stand by for verification. Copy, standing by. And OC, DevOps on Ops. Those parameters look good. We to are go to move the SMS motor. Audio. Copy, go to move. Okay. It's all about flames, fluids, and materials research aboard the International Space Station. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson. Welcome to Station Life. Houston at 2 for uh, Velocity Cost Rate. Houston at 2 for 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 Velocity